Hey guys, here's the whole topic summary for AQA Chemistry, the rate and extent of chemical change. Now this one has so, so many practicals in. If you want a list of all the key practicals you need to know for chemistry, physics and biology, you can get that in the free revision guide which is over on my website, or you can get it over on Amazon. When we are measuring the rate of a reaction, we need to look carefully at the units used. For example, here we have volume in centimetres cubed over time in minutes. So here it would be centimetres cubed per minute. And the second one, we have time in seconds and mass in grams. So this would be grams per second. In the first graph, it is volume of carbon dioxide being produced. So you can see that is going up. And in the second graph, it is mass being lost, so you can see that is going down. If you want to find the rate at a particular point, say 2 minutes or 5 minutes, you need to draw a tangent, which is a straight line, that touches the curve just at that point. Not at any other point, just at the point you're interested in. And then you need to work out the gradient of that line. To work out the gradient, you need to draw a triangle bigger triangle the better and we need to work out the change in up divided by the change in across and your units you need to take from the graph. You can compare the rates of reaction at different points in a reaction. For example at the start of this reaction our line our tangent is very very steep whereas later on in the reaction at a different point our tangent is very very shallow. Different rates of reaction at different points. There are a range of different ways you can follow a reaction. For example, you can look at the loss of mass. This would be good if you are adding something solid, um, like marble chips, into a liquid, and you knew that a gas was going to be produced. The gas will just go off here, through the cotton wool, and out, and the mass will go down. It would also, um, for the same reaction, if you had a solid and you're adding it into liquid and a gas was being produced, you could collect the gas either in a measuring syringe or an inverted measuring cylinder. We can follow the rate of reaction by looking at the colour change taking place in a reaction or how it changes from um, clear, colourless to opaque where we can't see across underneath it anymore. This reaction is between sodium thiosulfate sulfate and hydrochloric acid and you need to be really really careful with this one. Careful that when you're doing this you're constantly washing things out so you're not contaminating things. Careful that you don't take it above 60 degrees because then nasty gases will start to come off at the end. Um, and careful that you don't get it on your hands um, because it's going to start to irritate your hands. So with this one health and safety is a really big concern. You can see as the reaction is going on, the cross, which was visible at the beginning, is becoming less and less visible. You need to make sure that the same person always measures the rate of reaction here. So um, differences in people's eyes don't mean that the, the differences in the type of um, time that the cross disappears um, that affect the results. One way that we can collect gas is by using an inverted measuring cylinder and putting a delivery tube through there. One of the things you need to be careful about is this gas in here that is already in the measuring cylinder before you start the experiment. That is one place that errors can be introduced. The gas is going to move from the conical flask through the delivery tube and into the measuring cylinder and it's going to be collected and we can measure it. Adding in large marble chips now, you can see that the bubbles are starting to collect in the measuring cylinder. In this, not only can you get errors because there's going to be gas in the measuring cylinder before you start, but there is also going to be some gas lost um, before you manage to get the bung on. Adding in powdered calcium carbonate now, you'll notice that the rate of reaction, the bubbles are produced much, much faster, and the measuring cylinder fills up very, very quickly. When we have particles moving around at a low temperature, they're moving slowly with not much energy. When two collide, they hit each other and have a reaction, but sometimes they're going to collide and there's not going to be a reaction. When particles move around with high temperature, at high speed, with lots of energy, when things collide, you are going to get a lot of reactions taking place. 
rate of reaction is going to be affected by temperature. Here I have put sugar cubes into hot water and cold water and you can see the sugar cubes in hot water dissolved much, much faster than the sugar cubes in cold water. For the rate of reaction, we can say that the higher the temperature, the faster the rate of reaction will be. This is because the particles have more energy. So they can move around faster. And this will lead to more frequent successful collisions. When we have a lump of something, it has less surface area, so there is less space to react. Here the blue dots, whatever that is, can only react with the pink dots on the outside. The purple dots in the inside are exactly the same thing, they're just not available to react. Whereas here, the pink dots are all spread out in a powder format, so they're all available to react. This is really confusing because the lump of whatever it is, is larger than the powder. But assuming we have exactly the same mass, the powder has more surface area than the lump, so more particles are available to react. Here I have two identically sized blobs of glue, and one I've spread out, and one I haven't spread out, I've just left it as a blob. And you see the one that's spread out, the one that has a large surface area, dries much, much faster than the blob I've just left in a big blob. I have a WhatsApp group of all my YouTube friends and they were super, super jealous when I told them I was making a video of glue drying. We can say that the larger the surface area, the faster the rate of reaction, This is because there are more particles available to react. Leading to more successful collisions. If we have things at a high pressure or at a high concentration, there are more of them, which means they're much more likely to bump into each other and react. Whereas at a low concentration, they're not very likely to bump into each other and react. We can say that the higher the pressure or concentration, the faster the rate of reaction will be. This is because there are more particles in a fixed volume so there is a high chance of a successful collision
when we have a catalyst, it's something that makes a reaction easier to happen. It lowers the activation energy. So for example, this catalyst fixes one of the reactants in place so that it's easy for the other reactant to find it. Whereas over this side, they're both randomly wandering around in the dark. And it's quite hard to find people when you're randomly wandering around in the dark. Whenever we have a reaction, there's an activation energy. Instead of just going straight from the reaction to the product, there's this hump it has to get over. And this bit here, this difference is the activation energy. However, what a catalyst does is it lowers the activation energy so that it's easier for the reaction to take place. So the reaction is more likely to happen because there's less of a hump for it to get over. This half arrow on top of the other half arrow going the opposite direction is a symbol for a reversible reaction. Ammonium chloride will decompose into ammonia and hydrogen chloride gas upon heating. And this is an endothermic reaction because you need to put heat into it. Cooling it is an exothermic reaction because energy will come out. Hydrated copper sulfate, which is a lovely blue colour, upon heating will lose the water, turn into anhydrous copper sulfate, which is a white colour. Adding water in will turn it back to hydrated copper sulfate. Lechitelier's principle tells us that whatever you do to a reversible reaction, the reaction will do the opposite. So in this reaction, this way is endothermic and this way is exothermic. So if you heat up a reaction, the endothermic reaction will increase to compensate and the exothermic reaction will decrease to compensate. Whereas if you decrease the temperature, then the endothermic reaction will decrease to compensate and the exothermic reaction will increase to compensate so that the overall temperature stays the same. If you're going to change the temperature or the concentration, the reaction will also adjust itself to compensate. If you are going to increase the pressure or the concentration, then the reaction will shift to the side that has less moles to compensate. If you're going to decrease, then it will shift to the side that has more moles to compensate.